Thanks very much, Peter. Well, so you know where you are, I welcome you to the Melbourne section of the Audio Engineering Society. My name's Graham Huon and I chair the Melbourne section. Uh, this evening, we're, depending on where you are, we are going to have a run through of 50 years of audio production covering from black and white TV to feature, feature film production. Tonight, it'll be my pleasure to introduce Rick Curtin, who can wave. Yes, there's Rick. Uh, Rick Curtin has had an extensive 50 year or more career in audio, covering production, post-production, and for music and for television. He has extensive experience in design, construction and operation of production and post-production studios, <clears throat> both locally and overseas and is accredited to the Screen Sound Guild and in modern production facilities, particularly the Swiss Merging or Pyramix equipment. Rick has won many awards for sound production, including three Australian Academy of Cinema and Television Arts Awards, three Australian Screen Sound Guild Awards, and four Western Australian Screen Awards, which is a pretty impressive record. Tonight, Rick's going to take us through his experiences in the ever-evolving field of audio production for film and television. If you have any questions, a bit of administration, could you please take advantage of the in-meeting text chat facilities, open up the bubble, and you can put your questions in there to jot. And we'll also uh, ask that you can mute your microphone and certainly make sure that screen sharing is off. Um, please welcome Rick Curtin. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Graham. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for joining in. Um, basically, just for, uh, to start with, I'm just going to give you a quick, quick run through of the last 50 years, and it will be quick. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to show you around a little bit around the studio where I work. Um, and then I'll show you a little clip from the animated feature film, which we've just finished working on. And then I'll go in and dissect a little bit of that, showing you how we put it all together. Okay, so let's... So, basically... I started my early career at the ABC here in Perth, um, way back in 1970, as a, as a cadet. They were the only place in Perth at that stage that had any, any sort of audio training. On the day that I joined, another chap was also starting with us and the manager said that there's a bit of a, a quorum going on between TV and radio, though radio and TV were both together on the, in the same place. And basically radio was saying they should train TV audio engineers and TV was saying they should. <laughs> so they wanted a guinea pig. So uh, being me, I put my hand up. So off I went to radio for six months. And of course, the radio guys took me under their wing. And in that six months, I got to do everything from symphony orchestras to dramas to radio plays, obviously live, live radio and outside broadcasts. So after the six months, they put me back down in television to see how I compared with their, their guy. And basically, poor chap really had kind of done news and weather and a couple of OBs. <laughs> so there, there kind of was no, no dispute who, where, who got the best training. But there wasn't a lot happening at the ABC at that stage. And um, basically, Channel 7, which was one of the commercial stations, offered me a job because they needed audio guys, but they don't train anybody. So off I went to Channel 7. I'd only been there for six months and the two senior guys actually left. So at the age of 21, I, I was in charge of audio at Channel 7. And these, again, was in the days of lots of live shows, live, live commercials. And uh, I, I really knew that I didn't know enough. And uh, there was nobody around to train me. So uh, I am actually English. So I decided I'd go back to England and try and do some work over there and get some experience. So. I headed off to England and I got offered a job, I actually got offered two jobs. I got offered a job by the BBC and through for ITV. But even though being a British citizen, the actual union wouldn't give me a ticket to start. Um, so I, I obviously they couldn't put me on without a union. And so 
Um, I mucked around for a while, went on a holiday, and then I was about to come back to Australia. But just um, I just put an ad in Melody Maker. Melody Maker was the music newspaper of the time. I just put in an ad and just said, um, sound engineer willing to travel, looking for work. And holy baloly, but a, a band called Blackfoot Sioux answered the ad. Um, they had just had a, a massive hit and we had a huge amount of live gigs and had just were in the process of purchasing a remote mix PA. Um, up to that stage, everybody just had WEM columns and everything was just mixed on the stage. Uh, remote mix was very, very new. Um, and when we got it, there was only us and the who on the road at that stage with the remote mix PAs. So it, it was pretty amazing. Um, and the, we just had a, a whale of a time. And the, the, the band were, as you can see, the, the, for the time, there was twins in the band as well. Um, so we, and we did, uh, you know, we had this huge PA system and the last song that we did on the night was a instrumental version of the 1812 Overture. And I had the cannons and bells on tape and everything. And so letting that rip through a big PA system, most people had never heard of anything. And the two guitarists used to get on the side of the stage with big WEM stacks for the guitars. They would jump on, they'd, we had a ramp, they'd get to the top of the, the uh, columns and on, right on the very finale would jump and destroy the drum kit as they came down. So it was absolute chaos. Um, I mean, the, the band were, were sillyly huge. Um, at one stage during one week, our, our support groups were Susie Quattro, 10CC and Leo Sayer. <laughs> That's how we're doing. So we'd done a live show and we were in the green room afterwards. I was just sitting down and this chap was sitting next to me and he said to me, oh, have you, did you do the mix of the band? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, I'm Gary Lyons from Psalm. Now, at that stage, Psalm was the most impressive studio in London, it had everything that opened and shut. And he said, um, my two take ops are going on a week's course and I'm looking for somebody to fill in. Would you be interested? <laughs> of course. And just so happened, again, luck played an awful lot of part, but they, um, the band were having a couple of weeks holiday. So I went there and uh, did a couple of months of part-time work with them and then they offered me a full-time job. So I, I left the band and took that. Um, I've been there for a little while, was an engineer and we got a booking from Queen. Queen had booked the studio for two months to finish their album. They'd done all of the backing tracks at a living studio down in Wales called Rockfield. And they were still doing all the overdubs, all the vocals and all that they wanted to mix. Uh, in, in our studio because we had all the gear. So they, um, they had their own engineer and producer. So Gary, who owned the studio, said to me, look, can you just stay with them for a week? Just settle them in, make sure they know where everything is and how everything works. So yeah, working with Queen for a week, yeah, pretty gig. Um, but it was pretty chaos. They, they were facing, we had the two months to finish the album. Um, but they were also in the middle of rehearsing for a world tour and they had to go on that world tour. So it, it was crazy. So they actually asked me to stay on. So I ended up working with them and uh, got to work on both the album and Bohemian Rhapsody, which was amazing. The, the, they'd done the backing tracks for Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, and the first day that I was working with them, they just said, oh, look, we're, we're, we're just have, gonna have a coffee break. Can you just put up a, a can balance for Bohemian Rhapsody? We want to do some work on it. So I got it up and I got the track sheets and I'm playing through it, trying to get a can balance and trying to, you know, be impressive. It was only the first week with the band. And uh, I had no idea there was just stuff everywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> after a while I gave up and went back out to the guys. They said, oh, how, how are you going with the can mix? And I said, um, not sure. I'm not quite sure where it goes. They went, yeah, no, no, nor do we. <laughs> Let's go and see what we can do. Um, so yeah, so that was a great thing. So 
not long after the album finished, I needed to return to Perth for per personal reasons. And I got a job in Radio 6KY here, um, which was <laughs> pretty amazing coming out of Psalm, doing all that kind of stuff, and, and then end up working in a radio studio. But um, it wasn't all too bad. I met my wife while I was working at the radio studio, so that kind of worked out. So when things settled down, uh, I decided I'd move to the Eastern States because obviously Melbourne and Sydney was where it was all happening. And after a short time in Melbourne, I was offered a job at Studios 301 in Sydney. Their main engineer, Richard Lush, was returning to England for six or eight weeks and they just needed to, somebody to fill in. So I did that, I filled in for a while. And while I was there, we, I got to do some demos for the band called Dragon, um, which was quite interesting because they were a CBS act and CBS had their own studios, but Dragon being Dragon, decided they, they, they had to have a CBS producer, Dorky, but the, they just, just being, yeah, they go, nah, we don't want to work here, but we'll, we'll put up with EMIs. Um, so the other side was that they said, yeah, we'll, work, we'll go into EMI, but they said to the EMI people, we're not gonna, we don't want any of your engineers because at that stage they were all doing Sherbet and bands like that and they didn't want that. So they got me. So that was all right. We did the demos. That was fine. And so the demos went very well. And to cut a long story short, they then turned around and said, okay, we're, we want to do the album, album there, but they want me. So uh, Nigel, who was the boss at the time, said, okay, I suppose I better put you on full time then, which he did. So very quickly we did did an album called Ozambezi. And from that, the single, Are You Old Enough, uh, became quite a hit. Um, so yes, yeah, so I had a gr great time at, at 301, got to work with lots and lots of different people, including the amazing Slim Dusty, Slim Dusty rather, and his, his daughter, and Kilpatrick. And, uh, and they ended up doing their, their live album at the Opera House, which was another whole story. Anytime you've got a day, I'll tell you about the technical ramifications of trying to work at the Upper House in those days. So after, after uh, there, Len, I returned to Perth in about 1980, and uh, I got to work with some groups at the time who were Perth groups, groups called Eurogliders and the Jewgites. And then I started to work at a studio called Sound West, where I got to work with, with Kevin Peake, Kevin Peake at the time was in the group with Sky. And again, lucky break for me to work with him. We, we knew he was in town, he'd, he'd moved into Perth. And of course, as a studio, we were very keen to get him in. And we've been trying everything to try and find him. He, um, we didn't even know where he lived or anything. So I was busy doing another session and sort of herring off to go to the loo. And the receptionist, I walked past the receptionist, she said, I've got this, guy, got this guy on the phone. I, I have no idea what he's talking about. He's either a complete nutter or he, he, he might be somebody. I said, I haven't got time. I'm busy. Oh, no. She said, you've got to talk to him. So I picked up the phone. Oh, oh can I help you? Oh, yeah, it's Kevin Peake here. <laughs> he started rolling off. So, yeah, that, that was amazing. So we, we, we started doing some work. And he, while we were working, he went off and did a tour of England. He came back with this synthesizer called a DX7, Ron DX7, and it had this incredible thing called MIDI in it, which at that stage, nobody really knew anything about. And, um, and we had a Jupiter 8 at that stage. So we had a box that converted MIDI to gate and CV, and we were driving the DX and the MIDI. Um, so it was a very interesting times to try and sort all that out. And while we were doing that, he also um, invested in a, Australian invention called a Fairlight. Um, I'm sure most people have come across the Fairlight at those, but we were one of the very early um, uptakes of Fairlight. In fact, we were, we were turned out to be a beta test centre for them. And to get MIDI into that, once we got going, they sent us over this card with ribbon cables coming out of the back and boxes of this and boxes of that that plugged into it. But we, we, we finally got it going. And while we were doing there, we 
we ended up doing a, a synthesized version of the planets, the planet suite. And Rick Wakeman came over to play on it. And uh, man, can, can that guy play? He's <laughs> quite amazing. The first, came in on the first day, just got off a plane, got the charts out and went, <laughs> just like blitzed it. Um, but I've got to tell you, if ever you do get a chance to work with Mr. Wakeman, if you're going out to dinner, plan to have the next day off. <laughs> he knows how to have, to have dinner. Um, so it was great. And also, while we were still there, Sky actually came over and we did an album for them called The Great Balloon Race, which was great because um, Perth being a sleepy little town, they came over for a month and nobody knew they were in town until we did a big concert right on the very end. That was the only time that people knew they were in town. So in 84, um, I was doing a lot of work with Kevin and Kevin had a farm up in Raleigh Stone and, and some barns up there. And he decided that we just wanted a studio to ourselves because all the hours that we wanted to work was conflicting with the studio we we're in. So with his partner, Trevor, who was, who was the drummer, we ended up building a studio in one of his barns. It started off as a 24 track. Um, so we had the like a kitchen area at the back, Kevin's synth set up, the mixing console and a little live area down the back. So we were one of the first studios that had basically the control room was where everything was done and played. And not too long after that, we actually went up to the first 32 digital in, in the state, which was, which was quite a jump. So that all, all went very well. And also at the time we, were, we ended up starting to do a bit of advertising work. We, we started to end up doing a lot of advertising work for Singapore. And we got some great big contracts with a studio up there. We were doing Tiger Beer and Singapore Airlines. But the problem with in those days was uh, Singapore at that stage was, was a very tight country. And so we would do a demo of the track Send, it, send the quarter inch up, and it used to go to the sensor. The sensor had to listen to it before it went to the advertising agency to make sure there wasn't anything problem. So it was kind of like a three day turnaround time. We got it there, gone through the sensor, they heard it and came back. And so they said to us, um, put a studio together up in Singapore. So we did. So Kevin in his wisdom found a 10 story warehouse so our studio was on the third floor of a 10 story warehouse and it was literally just a warehouse when we started. And because of one of the complications of it, we had this very big G2520 console. We had to, put, had to put the console in the room first and kind of build the control room around the console. So we got all that going, but we, we, we still had the studio down in Perth and Kevin was doing a lot of work. So, um, we discovered this, this thing called ISDN, uh, which was very new at the time. And we realized that we could actually transfer files through the ISDN from Perth to Singapore and do things. So, which was very naughty, uh, very much a no-no. And it was so new that when the guys from Singapore Telecom came around to install it, they actually had to take their test gear out of the bubble pack, open it up and read the instructions of how to work it. So, yeah, we, we, we had a great time for a while and uh, doing stuff. So yeah, the, the studio was, uh, went really well. In 1992, after it was in Singapore, I got an offer um, from Hank. Now, I'd met Hank a few times through Kevin and Hank was also living in Perth and he wanted to build a studio again. He had a premise. And so he, um, and I was looking to come back to Perth so he asked me if I would build a studio for him, which I did. He had lots of gear and lots of stuff, uh, incredibly nice chap. And he was still doing a lot of touring at the time and recording in England. So I built the studio, then hired it back off him to do all my work and ended up doing a lot of work with a couple of jingle chaps who were next door. So after that, that was all going very well for a while. Then Kevin, uh, then uh, Hank, wasn't touring much and wanted to do uh, do some album work. 
but I had too much work for his, his studio here. I wouldn't, so he actually had ended up booking another Perth studio. So he was working in a Perth studio while I was in his studio. <laughs> so we had the inevitable lunch. <laughs> and as it was, again, just a lucky break, I managed to, I was down doing a restripe in a big video pro production house called Double G and saying that, you know, I was getting out of that studio and looking for a place. And they just said, oh, why don't you put, put some studios in the back? We're cleaning out the back areas and there's enough room for studios out there now because we're not shooting anymore. So we joined forces and I put two sound studios in there. Um, and that was great because it, again, it was a very new idea that they, you could do sound and vision all in the same spot. So they could do the edit there, come down the corridor, do, do <coughs> pardon me, do the sound post and then go back and restripe it, which was quite incredible for its time. And we started off with uh, DSP post stations, which are an Australian, they were built in Australia. They were amazing for their time, what they could do. They were also $110,000 each in 1995. We bought two of them. <laughs> and the video guys at that stage bought um, the computer animation, uh, computer called Front Aim, and that was close to a million dollars. So that all, all went well. We, and we were just incredibly busy doing uh, ads. It was in, in the mad advertising time. Um, and then in 2004, DSP unfortunately was no longer in existence and wasn't supporting the machine. So we moved off and I, I chose to move to a system called Pyramix rather than go to Pro Tools again, because the post-production was fairly high end post-production facility. We didn't want stuff that bas basically Pro Tools at that stage, you could buy it and put it in your bedroom. We just didn't want to. And the, the Pyramix had some amazing, uh, great ways of working with vision. And we had things like non real time bounce downs. And we had clip game that you could see the volume actually go up and down on the waveform as you were moving the clip game. And it only, only took Pro Tools about another 10 years to get that. <laughs> but that's another story. So that all went very well. But around this time also too, I was starting to get to do a lot more long form work for TVs and short films and stuff like that. And it was getting a bit conflicting between trying to get commercials done, which are like instant turnaround and long form jobs, which are long time. So in 2007, I moved out of there and into where I am now. So that's, so that's how we, we, we got to being here <laughs> in a very short time. <laughs> right. I'll, just quickly change cameras and okay so if, hopefully you can still hear me i swapped the mic to the, to the phone okay so this is the the setup that i've got at the moment basically rid of the stuff the um the control surface i use these days is a thing called tango which is um, although very small I'll, I'll show a bit more about the tango in a minute it's it does everything that you need to do uh, because basically you just pull you, you can control all of the different channels you just pull them uh, randomly and, and it works and this is built by the same guy who built the original post stations. So that's the control service. And I have one screen in front, which at the moment I'll show you in a minute. It's got, we'll have all the tracks on it. I have the vision on the other, on another one. And let's get rid of that. So the, the, the the outline of the mixes on the other screen, and then just a fourth screen that's just got the internet running at the times. So the whole thing is just I've got two two computers that run up one one computer runs the sound side, and the other computer runs the vision side. The idea of splitting them up is just just purely to take the load off the CPUs. 
especially when you're doing a feature and you've got loads of plugins. And that's just two, the two computers and the Horus interface, which is the digital interface. So we've got the big screen at the front, uh, which has got three speakers behind it, um, horn loaded, like they are the proper cinema speakers, the cricks from Adelaide. And around the walls, you can see there's the surround sound. In theatres, the surround sounds all down the walls. So there. And then when I'm doing broadcast, the TV just pulls into the, into the middle. Um, and then it's got two speakers, no, sorry, sorry, three speakers that comes out there. And the, their 5.1 is just one pointer. So there's two complete 5.1 systems, one for cinema and one for broadcast, because they're actually very different. And then just behind me, is a producer's area, so they can sit up there and tell me my mix sounds rubbish and uh, play with their computers and off we go. So that's just the, the and uh, the ceiling's quite high, but I've got a lot of diffusers on there to keep, keep it going. This actual room um, is actually inside my house and it actually is an old shop. In fact, behind there, that used to be an open door, which the footpath with people walking is literally just, just behind there and there's windows there. And a, lot, and a great thing about there's, there's two windows there and one over there, which the blinds are down at the moment. And the great thing is when I'm working broadcast, I can have working natural light, which is great. And uh, on a good day, I can even have the windows open. So I can work in the sound studio that's actually got nice fresh air. The tango is, is the thing that probably makes makes it work really well for me. As you, you've probably seen um, feature films are being mixed. They've got massive big consoles and stuff like that. The way that the tango works is that by using these controls here, I, I can just bring whatever channels I want to and it just keeps changing the whole console. So I have resume set up where I have all my mixes, then my sub mixes, and I can get into anything. So just by hitting a couple of buttons. And the, the great thing about it for editing is you have all of these little shortcut keys down here. But yeah, you know, like any shortcut, when you press it, that's great. That's a cut. Um, but Joey being so clever, what he's done is that when you release the button, that's also a separate command. So when you're editing, a lot of stuff's got enter onto it or you do something else. So all of that is into one command or you've done the command, you can let it go and that fires off a macro. So your editing is very fast. And I do a lot of dialogue editing, so it makes sense. And this is a complete touch screen. Um, so anything you want to do. So if you pull up an EQ, all your EQ comes up here. So you've got hard controls for all of your EQ, um, or you can bring up anything you want. Anything, the, anything that's on the mixer, you can bring down here and it's all just touched with real knobs and with real controls. So again, when you're trying to EQ, rather than trying to use a mouse to do very fine EQs, you've actually got knobs to do it. Or if you, Ken being Joey, you've got one knob here that will do it to the finest degree of what it'll allow it to do, and then a fast knob. <laughs> you try and find, find the EQ point, and then you can, you can uh, really maintain it. So yeah, this thing just makes my life um, really, really interesting. Unfortunately, they, they don't make them anymore, basically, because they, they turned out to be far too expensive. Um, so the front end driver, was costing far much more than the software that it was driving. But for me, for, for what it does, um, and the great thing about it is because instead of having a long console where I have to keep moving, I, I can just stay in the sweet spot all the time and just pull any of the channels that I want to to me. Okay, just pop you back down again for a second. Okay, um, right, I'll just give you a quick look 
Okay, so um, there's about two. So basically, the, the track count for for this is there's 220 tracks running to go through it. So what we start off with. Um, let's put them just here. Oh, is this how you make ice cream? Daddy, how did you? Wow. Hooligans, what the caramel? So we get get the dialogue. Obviously, all, all the voices are recorded. The voices are recorded before they start to animate because they have to do the lips. That's the theory. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, stars weren't cast when they started doing the animation. So a lot of it was um, done as ADR and not very well in places. There was a lot of resyncing, But also a lot of the, the clips were done over time and in different studios. Um, so Batty, for instance, was recorded in Australia and in LA because the actress was in LA for some of the time. And so a lot of the time you're not only trying to balance the levels, you're, you're balancing EQ, you, you're trying to get the rooms out of stuff. Um, so everybody has their tracks. So the, the top tracks are Freddie and then Batty and then everybody. So at the moment we've got Freddie, Batty and Crib. So we go through. Um, obviously while I'm, I'm, I'm doing the dialogue edit, uh, I've got a, a crew working with me. They're doing the Foley, the sound effects and the music. So all of, or, yeah. The orchestra was all done by the West Australian Symphony Orchestra. So it was all recorded. And then the, um, the guy who recorded it and the composer sit down and do me a mix, but they still send me stems. So they, so for instance, the orchestra is split up into all sorts of different stems. So I've got the main orchestra, the effects, solos, keys, um, synths, percussion, they're all split up. So again, even though it's sort of pre-mixed, I've still got plenty of space where I can move things in. So for instance, just you can hear the percussion things. So I've literally, when I come to do the mix, I've literally got control over everything. Everything again is also all, all the stems that 5.1 stems, uh, obviously, because it's a feature film, it's all mixed in 5.1. Um, so all the atmospheres are laid up. So this is the the atmospheres that go into making the background to, to Crips band. So we've got hums. We've got all sorts of different noises just to keep the van alive. And then obviously, once we go out, go outside for the clip, it, it changes completely. And again, the great way they lay it out for me is that everything's set. So in the atmospheres, I've got all my room tones, I've got winds, I've got traffic, uh, insects, they're all, they're all in line. So as I mix in, go, oh, okay, the crickets are too loud. I don't have to go through 220 tracks of stuff to find out. I know they're in the atmospheres and then I'll, I'll know that they're in the insect tracks. So uh, a lot of the mixing, when, I, when I'm mixing, we're actually doing clip gain on the actual clips rather than moving faders. Obviously, the music balance is all done with faders because that's the only real way you can do it. You have to, have to feel that. But virtually all the dialogue, for instance, all the dialogue is done with clip gain because uh, it's so much more accurate. Um, okay. So, and again, then when we come to the effects, so again, they're all split up. So I've got animals, human, props, electronics, cloth, furniture, again, all split up. So I can jump immediately to where, wherever they go. So once we get into the... So for instance, each little electric spark has got their own little track. So every effect is all separated out. 
and also to if it's if there's a perspective jump they'll put the track they've put the cuts on different tracks as well so i can uh, make make the perspective work so we go through all of those stories um and then we've got the foley with foley was all done by a guy called john simpson in adelaide who does amazing foley work he's um does a lot of stuff for park road in new zealand he does a lot of all the hobbit stuff he, he actually runs that as well goes over there and does it all to the pedantic part of john so for instance with batty's going to move here so and i'll just pull those up in volume so you can hear them a bit more let that move this this is actually batty's paw paw pins she lands but he also does for every every animal he actually does pads and nails so he goes through and does a set of pads for them coming down and then a set of nails for every foot that moves <laughs> and when you've got a scene with lots of animals in it's incredible so he and he goes down he does so foley he kind of does stuff that that's humanoid or moves so you'll do things like the, the jug falling over so stuff that's really easy to do with live props so you get the right bounce and sounds rather than trying to cut off an effects um, so um yeah so that's but basically all the, all the tracks and how it all goes together so then i just do um, end up doing a 5.1 mix and a stereo mix as I'm going and the idea of that is that when we've done so we'll do a mix and we'll preview the reel and then if they want to make changes then we can just go along and literally make the change and drop that into the mix so that we know that when they've heard the mix go past if they're happy with that that's printed then I can go in and just drop in to the master record and then that's all bounced out as a file and then all the reels are then not knitted together to make one continuous one okay um now um i need to stop sharing so i can see the chat line there it is um cool um that's a very quick <laughs> whiz through and so I'm, I'm happy to take questions well that's excellent am i on Yes, I can hear you. Uh, that's excellent. Excellent, Rick. You're very quietly spoken, but boy, have you had a heck of a lot of experience. <laughs> well, as, as I said with that, that slide, on, a lot of it has, has been, a lot of it's been amazing luck, literally being in the right place at the right time and just going for stuff. And uh, I'll pop over to Perth and get you to touch me so I can have some of your... <laughs> um, have you got a, any of the um, chat there, Peter? Uh, right, let's let's just go through the audio. Um, I've got a few here, but I don't know. I've got the full. Oh yes, yes, I think. Oh I yeah, okay, okay. I'll start with one. Here. Um, am I contemplating Dolby Atmos? Yes, I'd love to work in Dolby Atmos. Um, in Perth, no. Uh, we literally just don't have the budgets. But um, there are holes in the ceiling where all that. Um, diffusers went were marked where the atmos would go and the idea would be uh if we got a chance to do one we would pre-mix it here and then take it probably to sound firm or somebody like that to do the final final mix with with actually the real inlay kit which is exactly how i used it in the old days when we were still working on film before we got to dcp where you had to go into a sound firm or somewhere like that because they were the only ones that got the black box that you could encode it so i used to pre-mix everything here and then then break it take it over to sydney or, or melbourne music and effects in melbourne or or a sound firm but once um dcp came where we no longer had to go through the dolby process which meant basically i gave the dcp um my 5.1 tracks as wav files and it actually played them back exactly as I gave them to them, <laughs> not like the film system. Um, the first time I did it, we'd, we'd gone over and done done a film, 
and we were doing a, a big cast and crew playback here and they had done a, a competition for the film. So all the actors were coming over and the director was coming over. So we had two cinemas. So the idea was that people had won the contest, which was a great PR for the film. They went in there first. The actors were there, the director were there, did that, they rolled that and they were watching a print. And while, while that was going on, we were having pre drinks and then we went to a different cinema and that had DCP. And so unfortunately, because of the time constraints, I hadn't been able to stay back in Sydney for what we call the answer print to actually hear what the print sounded like coming back off film. So the cinema was the first time I'd heard the answer print or the print as it was, so there was no changing it. And it was like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's all right. And I walked into to the DCP and they rolled the DCP and went, oh, I'm back in the studio. Oh, there it all is, it's all over there. It was just wonderful. So I love DCP. Um, so that was great stuff. Um, yes. Somebody was uh, saying that uh, they didn't want uh, centered vocals or centered, centered dialogue. Michael Costa, where's Michael? Uh, okay. As in, sorry, um, not quite that. One of the questions was, uh, I, you need to set your Zoom session to stereo. No, I'm saying I, I defend the center voice, voice. <laughs> <laughs> on the dialogue. Uh, yeah. Okay, now, uh, what so, could replace your current kit, Rick? Um, as in, sorry. All your mixing equipment, you're saying that that's no longer made. What could replace it? Um, I've got a spare one in the, in, in the <laughs> other room. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I, I, I've never, I have not found anything that can do what this can do. Um, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I, and just be, because, again, because I've had... The great thing about it, when Joey built this, Joey was actually working for merging, building big consoles for to run Pyramix before they decided that that's not how it's going to needed to do. So he, when he built the Tango, it runs Pyramix like a dream because he knows Pyramix inside out. In fact, I can do things on Pyramix with the Tango that you, it's very difficult to do otherwise. Um, but it, I get a great story with it. All the control buttons, as I showed you down here, all your shortcuts. Uh, when it first came out, because I got a call from jo Joey and Frank who were running it and just said, you know, could you try one out and see, see how you find it? And Joey had pre-programmed it all to work with Pyramix and given you four buttons that you could program yourself. So I had it for half a day and was like, no, nah, I need more than four. So I emailed him and Joey said, I mean, I need more. Okay. So emailed him then the next morning, typical Joe, I got a, a patch for it and I, I had eight buttons I could program. So that lasted me till about midday and I emailed him back and said, no, nah, need more. And then the next morning I got an email going, stuffed you, you've got the whole console. <laughs> so what he does now is the, the console's got lots of layers. So you can leave it how it, it's set or you can turn it around and set it all up for yourself. And then you can do 10 layers of that. So if you had loads of operators in the studio, you could all have your own layers. You could just walk in and go, that's me, bang, the whole console comes back. So it wasn't, that wasn't compatible with the Pyramid's business model, or are they looking at that as another? Uh, well, at one stage, Pyramix were, were uh, merging, which are Pyramix were yeah. very keen to have this as part go, of it. Um, the, the, the main problem was to actually manufacture it. Um, it, it it's very, with the touch screen and everything like that, it's very expensive and they have to, the main problem was because it's all done in China that they will only do like runs of a hundred or 200. And then you have to put that money up front and you have a hundred or 200 of these things that you then got to try and unsell. And that wasn't such a, unfortunately such a great business model. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, Corey Green asked, is this an independent film you've been showing us or is it a major studio production? Um, it's sort of, it's, it's, no, it's, it's not a major studio one. It's, it's, a, it's done by a, oh, I suppose, I suppose uh, Studio 100, a fairly, uh, fairly large studio. It's done through, they own a company in Sydney called Flying Bark, which do a lot of animation. So, and 
Screen West here put some money into it. So all the post-production vision and sound was done in Perth in the mix. And a lot of the design was done. Um, so the chief designer from uh, Flying Bark came over and we had all local designers that designed all the characters, all the work, uh, to the point one of the designers, because with Freddie and Batty, they spent a long time on the ground walking around footpaths and down near road levels. They had one designer, his whole job was design footpaths and concrete going into roads for <laughs> the whole film. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, um, it's a reasonable budget, but it certainly wasn't a big budget. Um, it's going to be, it went straight, because of the COVID, it went straight to streaming in Australia, but uh, it is going through Universal as a release, whether it gets out. I don't know that it'll have a cinema run in Australia, but it may just stay on um, video on demand. Okay. But, Sorry, uh, David Lawrenson had a question about your clip gain having more resolution or being more accurate than your fader controls. Uh, not, 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 not such, such that it's more accurate, but it's like um, if you had a look at my dialogue. I mean, even in a sentence, I'm cutting, cutting words. I'm changing the gain in a word. It's just you'd just never be able to move a fader that fast. Okay. So to to the point. Um, I'm, I'm always pushing T's and D's because Australians don't sound their T's and D's. And in fact, for each of the characters, I've got a library of T's and D's that I'm actually putting in half the time because they don't. Uh, um, and we also have amazing what we call Walla tracks. Um, so for instance, when they're recording an artist, they'll, go, they'll get him to do, if he's got to do a grunt, they'll, they'll do you know, all, all sorts of different grunts, long, short, uh, yells and stuff like that. So I have this massive bank of, of founds and breaths and things I can put in as well, well for them. Forget P's and Q's, you're monitoring the nation's T's and P's. That's <laughs> yeah, so yeah. The, the, the beauty of clip gain, it means that I can be, be incredibly accurate. Um, it just, in between, t I just yeah. couldn't move, couldn't yeah. move yeah. the fader, yeah. the fader yeah. that fast. Um, and I'll, again, also too, when it's cut, then I can change the EQ on words and things like that, uh, which is all automated. Which yeah, that's good. Uh, right, Fabio asked, how did you manage to preserve your hearing during all these years of work in the business? I don't think I have. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, no, uh, it, it's, it's um, especially when I have young, young bods in the back. Um, yeah, I, I know the age is creeping in, but uh, I, I know enough, and, and the, the beauty, because this cinema is is, and is in my own house, um, I've got 4K Netflix streaming in here, so I get to listen to an awful lot of feature films that are done. So I know what they should sound like. And the, the beauty of it is, it's it's a, it, we've again been very lucky that towards the end uh, of a mix, the video guys have got the grade fairly close, so we will start making DCPs and we'll go into a cinema at eight o'clock in the morning and run it. Um, so they can see what the grade looks like on a big screen. I can hear it, you know, yeah, we, we go from small cinemas to four or 500 seaters and stuff like that all the way around. And well, a couple, couple of the cinemas in Perth it have the same cricks that I have. So that's always good fun. So that translates really well. But um, yeah, again, uh, we spent a long time lining the room up and it took, took about, 14 months to get the acoustics to where we, we wanted them. Um, but since then, we kind of do a mix in here and take it into most cinemas. And depending, I mean, the great thing about mixing for cinema is because you're not mixing against level, like you're not mixing against meters, you're mixing about against level. So uh, all the speakers are lined up to an SPL level. So it doesn't matter whether you go into a big studio or a little, sorry, big cinema or a little cinema, they should all be lined up to that same SPL level. So that helps the translation. ISA should be, don't get me started about cinema lineups. <laughs> really. <laughs> Thanks for that, Rick. Uh, Jan Wong, where's Jan? Ah, thank you. Jan Wong had the question about plugins and some of the most useful plugins you've found and you use. Um, I, Isotope RX. <laughs> 
denoise, de room, de clicks, uh, it de's everything, and it, and the yeah, uh, it's it's it's. I don't know how many channels of of RX I've got running. Uh, it's just standard in my template. Um, it it takes out clicks. It takes out Mike Russells. It takes out pops. It's the uh, we we had one stage where they had to go into a studio uh, because the the actor was only available for a short period of time, and they had excuse my French a fairly incompetent engineer, and it was as roomy as anything. And I had to run the DX D verb on it hugely to try and bring it in close and match the rest of the. I mean, most of the time in the dialogue editing, it was just trying to match all the stuff that was done over such a diverse period of time. So it, it sounds sounds absolutely good. But yeah, no, R, RX is, is my absolute favorite. And especially, I do a lot of documentary work as well. So it's just wonderful. Takes the wind, take winds out. Um, it takes when, when the radio mics there's lots off little clicks as it moves on off station. I, again, I can go in and draw them out, but you just put it through there, it just disappears. It, it's, I, it's my one. I hope it isn't taking out your, your T's and S's. Or <laughs> no, um, yes, so that the um EQs and stuff most of the time I actually use the EQ that came, comes with the DSP, the, the their EQ system. So that sounds lovely. Um, again, depending on what else I'm doing. Um, yeah, different compressors, uh, I, I, again, it becomes very much depending on what you're doing. Um, it's a lot of it's horses for courses. You, know, you know, think like everybody, you settle in with ones that you know that, that work. Um, but yeah, um, Evo channels I've, I found working really, really nice. Um, low air, like all the effects. For instance, a lot of the effects have got low air, what we call low air signal, especially in the 5 1 mix, which really excites the sub. So when something hits, you get that nice thwack down the bottom end that moves a lot of air. And yeah, it, again, just depends on, on what, you, what you're doing. No, very good. Um, the question from Kyle Evans. Kyle, where's Kyle? No. Uh, Kyle was asking whether you used actual dog vocals. I think they were listening closely to the first dog snatch uh, sequence. I'm trying to think what's what's in there. No, they're all no in 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 that sequence. Yeah, all all Freddy stuff. All all, all Freddy and Batty dogs are them. Um, okay. There are bigger scenes with lots of dogs and pack dogs. There are dogs inside that there's real dogs mixed in, in with human dogs. We right. did, we, we tried, we did a lot of experimenting before we even started mixing because with the werewolves, when they become werewolves, they roar a lot. Um, so we had, um, de uh, there's a lovely toy called Dehumanizer, which you can actually take the sound of a, a proper werewolf or you know, a proper tiger um, and you put the human one in and it drives the envelope of that sound and you mix that back with the human. So you have the human sound, but you have a real tiger sound, but it's being modulated by the voice. De Dehumanize is great. It works, works really okay. well with that. But we do a lot of experimenting beforehand. Um, we, we I suppose we actually worked on it on the actual film when we first started getting the the real animation. We probably had probably eight months, but for four months before that, uh, we were doing tests and doing bits and pieces to line drawings and developing the the sounds of the voices because that also informed the animators as well. Um, okay. Uh Connor Harding asked, or Connor Harding Collis asked, do you work with Foley or Effects Library? Which do you prefer? Both. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, yeah, look, it, you know, if, if the budget will allow Foley, it, it's always great, and especially if you have somebody who knows. Everybody reckons they can do Foley, but there's, there's not a lot of people who can do it really well. Um, Simo, Simo does it great. Um, Foley can add so much to it. It's it's really good. Um, 
if you're doing a documentary when you don't have there, um, I'm very good at cutting footsteps. Um, then again, there's a couple of programs that help help do all that. Uh, you can play it with the keyboard. You can actually play play the feet in. And again, the great thing about that with the depending on how hard you hit the keys changes the the dynamics of the thing. So it's it's not just exactly the same blop 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 blop. Yeah, it's actually you can actually dement it, but that does take time, and it's never as good. Um, I mean, John is so so pedantic is that he will actually wear the same clothes that the actor is wearing when he does the footsteps, not the, not just the shoes. I've got lots of photos of him in the nice dresses. Um, but because he because you get the swish or, or you get the sound of the jeans, if they've got jeans on you, that's part of he does rustle tracks as well. But, you know, he, he's so pedantic that that's you get that. And it's like everything. It just fits in, fits in, fits in brilliantly. We're getting quite a few questions here. Uh, somebody asked whether you entered the audio industry. Who was this? Harrison Leithhead. Did you enter the audio industry with hopes of working in a particular field or were you happy to dive in? I think you've answered that at the start a little bit. Yeah, no, I had, um, in, in fact, before I started doing the audio job at the ABC, I was actually working at Channel 7. I had a, I, yeah. I, I had a holiday job. Um, I won, Sorry, I wanted a holiday job and uh, they advertised for camera people and I went up there and they, I walked into the interview and they just laughed at me and just said, <laughs> you know, because I was a little, I'm a very small little part, so there's no way you're going to be able to push a camera around. So they showed me down to videotapes and telecine and uh, so we said, look, uh, would you like to work in here? And it's like, uh, uh, yeah, I think so. Um, so I, I, I was working there for, for a while until somebody gave me some stuff that said, oh, can you take these up to the audio mixing unit up in Studio One? And I walked up there and, the, I mean, I'd always had an interest in audio, but never really considered it as a career. I walked in there and there's a guy in his own room with a big console in char charge of everything. So, yeah, <laughs> that'll, that'll do. <laughs> so that's that's why I went up and started doing it. And it's just, um, you know, I, did, I did that. Then from that, I got into doing music. From When I was working with Kevin, we were starting to do a lot of film music. And from that, we started even doing some post way back then we had a system where stuff was still being edited on sprockets but um, so they, they'd edit the dialogue on sprockets we would dump those to a multi-track and then we do all the track lay on a multi-track so there was faster there was no spacer um, we had an editron from Rome circle we had we had one of the original editrons that worked <laughs> some most of the time um, and then once we'd finished the mix, we would dub it back to full coat and then it would get to double head and go off to do the system. So, and it kind of got slowly. And then when I was um, work, working with, um, in, in the studios, in Hank's studio, it had got to the stage where everything, all the music was just programmed. There was very little live players. And it, basically I spent most of the time fixing up people's other programming, which is used to drive me mad. I wanted to work with real people. So that's why I moved off. and ended up accidentally getting into 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 this this field. Well, we're glad you did, actually. Uh, I've got a question here for a change of pace. It's a technical question. Yep. Are you ready? Yep. What sampling rate and bit depth do you typically use in Pyramix Tango door? Uh, 4824. Uh, 40, 48K, because that's what we have to deliver, uh, both for T mainly for TV. Um, sometimes the stuff will come to me, especially music will come in at 96, but we have to down it to 48 and 24 bit. Again, most of the delivery systems that we, we are mandated to, to supply are 24. So uh, the dialogue, uh, it, it, live sound is recorded at 2448. Yeah. Unless, unless you've got lots of budget, you can go up, and but you have to come back down again. Uh, that, that's uh, otherwise. I mean, when we have um, for anything we do, film or documentary, we get we get a wad of delivery stuff that we have to not only the different mixes, the, the different stems we have to deliver, um, but the actual uh, levels and all that kind of stuff are very detailed. What we have to deliver. I mean, with the new loudness standards. Um, 
we basically, if you're half a dB, literally half a dB over that standard, they'll send it back to you. Mm. <laughs> and that's in an hour program. <laughs> wow. Um, that's, that's excellent. I, I had a question which related to how you generated Atmos mixes, if you had to, how you generate that from your 5.1 and stereo mix downs. Uh, are you, are you, I mean, are you an Atmos mix as such? Yeah. I mean, oh, no. Effects, I mean, the Dolby Atmos. I don't know if you're doing Dolby Atmos, that no, no, you'd have to track lay it t totally different. You you would track you would track lay the Atmos yeah, from the start. On a 5 .1. No, right. You okay. can't. You, you can come down. It's really easy. Um, so you got your Dolby Atmos, which could be whatever it is. Um, but then you can fold that down to seven one, and then fold yeah. that down to five one. I mean, so for instance, I work in five one, but I fold it down to stereo. So I'm I'm doing the stereo mix yeah, as I'm doing doing the 5.1 mix. Oh, but yeah. no, if you, you, yeah. you basically have to start at your highest level. You, you, I mean, I can upvert. I mean, I've got upverters that take stereo music up to 5.1 and give it a bit of spread and do all that kind of stuff and effects where I can spread them. But uh, no, you, you really, if you're going to do anything serious, you need it in, in the highest range that you can. Okay, um, any more questions? Well, Rick, that's amazing. Uh, a really good insight into the day in the life of a <laughs> modern production person. Excellent, excellent work. Thank you very, very much for that. Oh, it's been a pleasure. On stage, somehow, we usually give a small gift that involves a stealth enclosure to a guest, but I guess we'll have to put that on hold for you. Oh, yeah, well, and, uh, wait, wait, I'm uh, about to get over there at some stage. <laughs> yeah, Rick, Ma Ray, Wick, Rick Wakeman, anywhere near it. <laughs> um, okay, I'd yeah. like to thank you very, very much for that. And uh, I think if we can all silently uh, thank, thank Rick for his time and his effort that he's put into it. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. It's the lame sound of a clap. <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, over to you, Peter. And uh, if you want to shut down and if there's any questions afterwards, please email them into us and we'll do something with them. But uh, thank you all for attending. Hmm. You're now qualified for on location sound, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's too hard. I'll leave it for oh, the I don't think you've qualified. You've done it on my <laughs> I'll leave that for young people. Yeah. Yeah. With long booms these days. Long booms. Yeah, it, it's really it's really interesting, isn't it? The, 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 on location, the cameras are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and the audio gear is getting bigger and bigger and bigger with all the links, all the cams, all the, all the stuff that they've got to cut around these days. It's just amazing. Yeah. So, it's quite incredible. We thought Nagras were heavy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all the, you know, all the, all the different stuff that they've got to put out, all, all the, all the link stuff, all the comms stuff, everybody having different feeds in the headphones and all, all of that stuff. It, it gets, it gets quite complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and also too, everything now is, I mean, I, I, I consistently get 12, 16 tracks in a drama. I, I get 12, 16 ISOs. Um, so everybody, everybody's ISO, which is you know, time consuming, but great. It means I've got the boom, which I can use if I can. Um, but then I've also, I mean, even, even if the boom's good, I'll still use a little bit of the ISO just to give the front of the words because they're, they're, they're very close. So you always get that nice kick in, in, in the front. But obviously, so you try and use the boom as much as possible. T's and S's. Yeah, <laughs> true. Uh, that's one reason I retired. I was going to have to start using more than four radio mics. <laughs> <laughs> These yep. days you can cook your lunch on the RF. But the diet in the heart, diet in the heart, I suppose. The cinema buff always mixes dialogue to the middle. Yeah, most of the time. Oh, Rick. <laughs> I know, there's time, there times when it, it wanders off. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you, again, when, you, when you're mixing for cinema, a dialogue especially, you've got to be very careful where you place it because if you get too wild, I mean, you can pad it right off to the, off to the right, which is 
if the people are sitting right on the right hand side of the cinema, the dialogue can actually get louder for them. And the people who are sitting way back over on the left side, they can actually miss it. So you... They should make more for their seats, shouldn't they? Yeah, you've got to remember the cinema is, depending on the cinema you're in, you, you, the width, you've got to be, especially with dialogue, you've got to be fairly careful where you it, put it. It works really well until some blighter doing the, the photography does a scene cut, left shoulder, right shoulder sort of scene cut, and then chaos breaks out. Oh, I mean, a complete Japanese movie done that way where they do all the A talk, B talk cuts and they swap the audio every time. And I have to tell you, it did not work. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a constant, it's constant battle. I mean, and you know, it, it's same with mix, it's just mixing for your environment. For instance, like when, when we've done the feature mix, when we've done the 5.1 mix, we will then do a mix for streaming and then we'll do a mix for broadcast. Yeah, Again, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a different, very different. I mean, it all, it's kind of kind of the same, but you've got to know. I, in, in some ways, actually doing the five point one mix is the easiest mix because it's great. You've got amazing amount of headroom. You've yeah. got usually people in a confined environment that's at least got the speakers sort of where they should be. Whether they work or not is a different matter. But <laughs> we have um, because we go out and do tests in cinemas. I have a DCP test that I make them play before we do a run and I've checked, checked the speakers and levels and things like that. The amount of problems I find, cause I got caught out the first one I did, you put it up and it sounded like a dog's breakfast because everybody just sitting in the cinema going, what the, <laughs> go, no, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but yeah, some of, the, some of the problems we find now just, yep. I did see a, almost a complete series uh, of fine, what was it? Briny Fisher, I think it was, uh, where they'd taken a 5.1 mix as a source material and just pulled the left and right stereo. And so it was almost no dialogue for, for, for most, of the, most of the episodes. And it took a long time to turn on the centre channel. Mm. Uh, actually, it's very interesting if you do um, 5.1 mixes for Nat Geo. Nat, Nat, Nat Geo you can only put dialogue in the center channel. You can't put music or effects or anything in the center channel because for them to put their other language versions on, they literally just take yeah, the center channel out and pop, pop it in. So for all your center of effects, it's really weird. So you've got a yeah. um, phantom, phantom center yeah. for your effects and a hard center for your yeah. dialogue, yeah. which, yeah, which can get very interesting. Yeah. So. And then when you mix it out, it's a good idea to put the center into the stereo mix. Mm. Otherwise, you've got no dialogue at all. <laughs> Could, yes. So, Rick, yep. your DAW system, when yep. you've got all your tracks set up, can if you have to deal with people that only use Pro Tools, can can they cross reference? Uh, I the. Not normally goes backwards, uh, basically because I usually end up doing the mixing. So oh. most of the stuff is laid up on Pro Tools and oh. it comes comes to me as double AFs. Oh, so if okay. you know what double AFs are. Yeah. Uh, AAFs AFs are a system where whatever the editor has, I get exactly all of those sounds with all the naming and with all the timeline. So it drops it back into my timeline. I can give them double AF back if they oh. need to do something. Uh, but they can't take, we can't swap sessions like you can if you're on Pro Tools. Oh, so, okay. okay. Uh, I, I, I got into Pyramix purely because that's like when it first started, it's the headroom it had and, oh, I mean, it still has, it's still got a most, most of the big uh, classical recordings, high-end recordings, DSD recordings and stuff like that are all done on, with Pyramix all because right. it's, a, it's quality. I mean, when I first got it, um, so the track layers, maybe using five or six different effects as part of effect would give me the raw sounds plus their mix down. So I would knew what, what they were intending. Right. Um, so if I opened up their mix and reset it up, 
their their mix was about that big. My mix was about that big. Huh. That was the, that was you could the difference was incredible. Uh, just purely purely because the, the headroom in this machine is just sensational. Um, you can yeah, it, it just because because you, you're mixing in the box, you know, um, so you, you you need all that space. Yeah. Thank you. Rick, what sort of storage capacity do you have on the system? Um, basically, as, as many many hard drives you want to chuck at it. Um, basically, we I'm just running one terabyte drives, and audio is comparatively small. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. So I've got um, basically in there. I've got three drives. Um, we've got, got system drive. This oh, well, four drive. Got the system drive. I've got a drive with all the audio. I've got a drive with all the mixes, and I've got another drive with all the junk. <laughs> so yeah, so that that keeps. So when I when I'm mixing down, I've got one. All my sound is coming off one drive and being recorded by another drive. So I'm not trying to get the drive to do do both things at the same time. Thank you. Um, do you, would you? Oh, I don't know if you've. Do, do you consider uh, using solid state discs as well? Uh, we, we have done. We have done. Or we uh, merging had done some experimenting with it. They're getting better, um, but for ease and cost and reliability. At the moment, we're 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 still staying with the old old discs because right. the, the speed we get off them anyway. The the other great thing about Pyramix, one one of the things that makes it work really really well, is for interesting. Um, so like you've got six cores in the in the CPU. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a system called Mass Core. So basically, what that does is it pinches five of the cores, so it leaves one core for the computer to do what the computer needs to do graphics and stuff like that but the other cores are totally they're not going through the system they're actually hived off the system before it opens so we have control over a massive amount of cpu i mean at this this whole thing i've got 200 odd tracks running and um with all of the uh stuff i've got i'm only using 50 percent of my core and 27 percent of my vst power all right so that, that's what I'm talking about. The headroom on the machine is, sure. is incredible. Uh, and that's one of the other reasons why I run the vision. You can, as you saw, when I was playing, I, I can run vision inside this machine as well. Mm -hmm. um, but especially when I get closer to the end and I'm getting very, very big video files, like when we get the final grades and stuff like that, you know, they, they can be six, 16, 17 gig file uh, vision. So it's just easier for the other computer to run that to just, takes takes a bit of a load off and also too with <coughs> with the the video i've got i can do a lot of video editing as well and drop stuff in and, and change things around uh, which, which works really well and, and fast turnaround stuff right what do you use for your video resolution are you working um standard 1080 or are you up to 4k no, no 1080 but because that's what i get delivered okay um, so i mean the, the the, the final final stuff will yeah when, when we get out there the, because the, the, they become very big, the DSP file becomes a very very big file so we tend not to run that till till the the last possible moment because it's just if they do any changes to it it's it's, it's a bugger and as I say we're, we're getting we're getting changes on the last day of the last mix for each reel <laughs> with the animation. Thank you again, Rick. It's been an excellent presentation. I've learned a lot. Oh, good. Thank you. But yeah, if you've got any, any Peter's, Peter's got my email. So any anything pops up, you want time, just send him stuff. He'll send it through to us. And send it through to Rick or send it through to us in Melbourne, whatever way you want to do it.